Jesus, Peter, James, and John go into a bar. <laughs> not quite, not quite. Uh, but it kind of sounds like that, doesn't it? Um, Jesus, Peter, James, and John go up on this mountain. And, and that's where we, we begin today um, with that. T today, actually, we're going to cover, again, 50 verses today. We'll do our best to, to get through this quickly, um, but also informatively. Uh, we're going to be talking about transformation. Um, with that, uh, also a demon-possessed boy. Jesus is beginning again to talk about his death and also um, recognize your allies. Uh, the, the, the movement is beginning to spread. And so how do, how do the disciples and Jesus deal with that? Uh, first of all, I want to show you again a couple of pictures uh, with that. On your tables, you actually have this map, uh, which you'll see. There we go. Thanks. And uh, I forgot my pointer. So at the very top of the map you see there is Mount Hermon. Uh, remember, that's 9,000 feet tall. Uh, it is snow covered um, so during most of the time of the year with that. But if you drop down from that to the Sea of Galilee, you'll notice just to the left of that, also in, in the brown or yellow there, uh, is Mount Tabor. Uh, those are the two traditional sites of the Transfiguration. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more in a, in a few moments about which one is which. Um, and why one might be more prevalent than the other uh, with that. But uh, you can see on the map also, this is a helpful map, I think, also for some of the, the cities and some of the other things that you hear about in the Galilee area. And so uh, it's a good thing to have, and uh, you can fold that up and stick it in your Bible for future reference with that. Uh, but, but what about where is the location, and, and why is um, one maybe more prevalent than the other. By tradition, if you'll show the next slide, um, Mount Tabor is the one. If you look at your map, Mount Tabor is farther south. Um, by history and tradition, Jesus sets his sights on Jerusalem, and he begins to head south. And the transfiguration takes place somewhere along that journey by, by tradition. And uh, he has been up at Caesarea Philippi is at a point in the Gospels that uh, Peter says, you are the Messiah. Uh, he does it at a, at a pagan place that uh, has, to our knowledge, the only time that Jesus and the disciples are actually there. Um, and so it either takes place there at Mount Hermon or at Mount Tabor on the route to Jerusalem. So he is heading south, or he has stayed in that general area uh, of the Mount Hermon. And so um, several things that it talks about in the scriptures that lead us to one place over the other is that Mount Tabor uh, actually has people that lived on it during the time of Jesus. And one of the things the stories tell us about it is that Jesus and the disciples went away to be alone. Um, and so... Plus, this mountain is 2,000 feet high. The next mountain, which we've talked about before, Mount Hermon, if you'll go to the next slide, um, is 9,000 feet tall. It also is already white. <laughs> and part of what we hear in this story is the magnificent transformation that takes place with Jesus uh, with that. And nobody lived on Mount Hermon at the time of Jesus. So um, it's also very high, which is also what we hear in the scriptures. Uh, but this picture is taken from the Sea of Galilee, which you can see on your map. Mount Hermon is 30 miles north, and you can see how prominent it is even from the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this is actually taken on a boat um, as we're out on the Sea of Galilee. Down the bottom left, you see the little white building there. That is Capernaum. Um, so this is on the Sea of Galilee, and we're looking north with that. Um, so anyway, you have this white, um, this white-covered, snow-covered mountain. Uh, next slide, please. This is a little closer up. This is at the foot of Mount Hermon. Uh, you can see not only do you see the snow upon the mountain, but you also see the cloud uh, that kind of sits there a lot of times of the year because of the, the temperatures and also uh, the weather with that. And then another picture here. And this one is uh, going to be in our final story today, uh, or in one of the final stories today. It talks about caring for the little ones, 
caring for the young ones in the faith. And if you don't care for them, what's God going to do where Jesus won't have happen to you is you put one of these millstones upon your neck and throw you in the water. This is a millstone. Uh, this is a, an olive press um, that is it's uh, Capernaum, and it's made out of basalt, which is basically volcanic ash um, and volcano uh, remnants, and so it, it is there. So uh, I believe that's the pictures, and let's move on then to, to, to the actual text that we have here. I'm uh, going to try to move through this in a way that will be helpful to you, um, but we can get through all of the text that is here. We first of all start off with Jesus continued, I assure you that some standing here in this spot won't die before they see God's kingdom arrive in power. Uh, this is seeing and believing. Uh, with that. So Jesus is standing there with the disciples. Many a times when we read this initially, we think this means that, that before Jesus dies, the, the kingdom of God will come upon the earth and that the people that are living there will actually get to experience that. Well, what I believe we're really talking about at this point is Jesus is saying to these three guys that are standing here with him, Peter, James, and John, before you die, you're going to be able to see the kingdom of God in your presence. And he does that as he's getting ready to lead these guys up to transfiguration, uh, where he will become, uh, in his bodily form, uh, a presence of the, with them. And so Jesus will allow them to see it um, so they can have no doubt. There will, there will be no obstruction of any kind. They will be able to see with their own eyes uh, what it means for Jesus to be transformed. And to be there with also, we find out later, Moses and Elijah with that. Uh, darkness has limited their sight, their ability to see. Um, it's unclear with that. In fact, that's part of the frustration that Jesus has, obviously, is that they've been following him now for three years, almost three full years at this point, and they still, a lot of times, don't get it. Uh, how many of us don't get it a lot of times? Yeah, even today. Uh, we often don't get it. So anyway, we move from that to uh, the, the text in verse 2. Six days later, James, uh, Jesus took Peter, who is the oldest disciple, James, who is the youngest disciple, and John, who is James' older brother, and brought them to the top of a very high mountain, maybe Mount Hermon, by tradition, Mount Tabor, um, where they are, were alone. He was transformed. Now, how many of you played with transformers when you were growing up? All right, confess, yeah. What is a transformer? It's a robot. It's like it turns into a vehicle or a robot. It is, it is either a vehicle that turns into a robot or a robot that turns into a vehicle, uh, depending upon which way you're going with that. So transforming is, is an opportunity to be revealed at this point as the Son of God in the presence of of these three guys. And if you remember, one of the things that validates uh, an event that is taken in spiritual nature is to have three witnesses. So there's some reason that Jesus is taking three guys with him, Peter, James, and John. So he's transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if he had been bleached white. Elijah who by history and tradition in the Old Testament is the chief prophet of God. Uh, of all the prophets, Elijah is the one who has the most history, who has the highest uh, ranking, if you want to call it that, of, of prophets. So Elijah and Moses, who is the lawgiver, if you remember, it is Moses who goes on to Mount Sinai and receives the Ten Commandments, the laws of the people with that. And they appeared and were talking with Jesus who is the Son of God. So we have the validation that is there, uh, but we also have these representatives of the law and also the prophecies uh, that, are, uh, that are to come. And so uh, God is undeniable at this point. They are in the presence of God. Uh, and, but Jesus is not the lawgiver, but he is the word of God. Uh, he is not the prophet, but he is the fulfillment of the prophecies. Uh, he's veiled in flesh as he is with people on, on the earth, but he is unveiled by God in this particular moment. 
in, in this particular time, he takes on more divinic um, appearance than he has as a human being. And it says that he's whiter than white. He's, he's almost bleached. Uh, and again, potentially on Mount Hermon, if you're up there, could be a whiteout. Uh, it could be a situation where in this moment, Jesus is so bright, so full, and again, bouncing off of, of the snow that is there. Uh, in essence, Moses and Elijah have come to this place. The leader of the law, the leader of the prophets, have come to sit together with Jesus, symbolizing the fulfillment of the prophecy and of the law. Jesus is the one who now uh, goes. And basically, Moses and, and Elijah are saying, go now. <laughs> we bless you. Uh, we are the ones that come this day to proclaim you, and we move on with that. So Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, uh, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines. Some traditions or some translations say tabernacles or booths or tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond. For the three of them were terrified. Don't know what to do? You know, anxious Peter? Let's do something. Let's build some, some booths here. And, and they were terrified. And interestingly, the word that is used here is the same word that's used for the shepherds in the field. They were sore afraid. They're terrified. They've never experienced anything like this before, and they don't know what to do. Um, so they're, they're kind of in this awkward place at this time. Uh, then a cloud, uh, Shekinah, which is uh, a word that means... Uh, glory cloud, if you want to call it that. It is, it is a, a word used for the cloud in which we find the presence of God. So Shekinah uh, overwhelms them, overshadows them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, this is my son. When we've heard this before, at his baptism, as he's coming up and out of the water, God proclaims, this is my son. So again, we have the fulfillment of the prophecy uh, of his coming because God is in the presence there. Uh, where else have we seen clouds? We've seen clouds uh, leading the people in the Exodus. Uh, Moses went up on the mountain and was, was involved with the cloud. The cloud of God is in the presence there. But it's also the cloud that leads the Israelites during the day and fire at night. So cloud is there. Um, and so this is my son, same as when he's baptized, whom I dearly love, listen to him. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of the prophecies. He is the one to listen to from this point on. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone, because the time is not right yet, what they had seen until the human one or the son of man has risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves. But they're also wondering, what's this rising from the dead? Still, they don't get it. <laughs> Jesus has told them, but they don't get it. They asked Jesus, why do the legal experts say that Elijah must come first? It is Malachi, who is the prophet, that proclaims that Elijah must come and be seen before Christ can come again. And so he answers them, Jesus does. Elijah does come first to restore all things. Why was it written that the Son of Man would suffer many things and be rejected? In fact, I tell you that Elijah has come, but they did not uh, did it to him whatever they wanted, just as it was written about him. Now, where has Elijah come before? Many proclaim um, that it's actually in the prophecies of Elijah that it will be filled, fulfilled by John the Baptist. John the Baptist takes on the role of Elijah as the one proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. He also is killed by Herod. Uh, horrible things have happened. So the fulfillment through the, the uh, transformation that is taking place here uh, is, is the coming of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. We move from that to a demon-possessed boy. Verse 14, uh, when Jesus, Peter, James, and John approached the other disciples, now remember there's nine that did not go up on the mountain. 
So as they're coming down, they encounter the other nine. They saw a large, a large crowd surrounding them and legal experts, meaning the scribes, arguing with them. Suddenly, the whole crowd <coughs> called Saul, caught sight of Jesus. They ran to greet him, overcome with excitement. Jesus asked them, meaning the legal experts, what are you arguing about? Someone from the crowd responded, not waiting for the legal experts to respond, Teacher, I brought, you, I brought my son to you, since he has a spirit that doesn't allow him to speak. <clears throat> Wherever it overpowers him, it throws him into a fit. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and stiffens up. So I spoke to your disciples to see if they could throw him out, but they couldn't. And that's surprising to the disciples, because before this, Jesus has given them the power to heal, and they've been able to do that. But in this case, for whatever reason, they're unable to do that. Um, and so they say, um, in the, and it appears the boy actually has two problems. One, he's unable to speak, and the other is he has epilepsy, or what we would call epilepsy today uh, with this. And Jesus answered them, you faithless generation, how long I will, will I be with you? How long will I put up with you? <laughs> you know, Jesus is saying, you know, I've been at this, you're still not getting it. You know, this is frustrating to me uh, with that. Bring him to me. And, and Jesus at this point, I think, is unhappy with the Father. He's unhappy with the nine disciples. He's up, unhappy with the legal, uh, the legal experts here because of what he perceives to be their lack of faith. And so they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a fit. He fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been going on? He said, since he was a child. It has often thrown him into a fire or into water trying to kill him. If you could do anything, help us. If you could do anything, help us. Show us compassion. Um, the, the father is basically hopeless at this point. He's tried everything. They, they don't know what to do. And because of the epilepsy and in perceived to be a demon within him, uh, it has been almost a life and death situation at times. Um, he's gone into convulsions, and because of that, he's, he's fallen into fire. He, he's fallen into the lake or into water, uh, and with that, it's all been a very, uh, very difficult situation for him, and so uh, he wants him to have compassion on him. Have compassion and show your mercy on us. Um, and it's really not a, a matter of Jesus having the power to do it, but Jesus will mention, you know, it's, it's who has the faith uh, to, to do this. And so we'll move forward. Um, it is often thrown him into the fire and wanted to kill him. Uh, then Jesus said to him, if you can do anything, <laughs> you're saying to me, <laughs> if I can do anything, uh, all things are possible for the one who has faith. Uh, again, Dad, you need to have faith. And, and how many of us have been in the situation where all it takes is our faith and yet we doubt? Uh, there are times when we become uncertain. As things become more difficult, uh, we, we became, become less certain of, of our faith uh, with that. So Jesus said to him, if anything, I'll do it. At that time, the boy's father cried out, I have faith. Help my lack of faith. Uh, those times that we fall short. Whatever happens, it's up to you, Lord. I put my trust in you. Noticing that the crowd had surged together, Jesus spoke harshly to, to the unclean spirit. Moot and deaf spirit. Jesus calls it by name, sort of. Uh, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. After screaming and shaking the boy horribly, the spirit came out. The boy seemed to be dead. In fact, several people said that he had died. But Jesus took his hand, he lifted it up, and he arose. And Jesus went into a house. His disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we throw out the spirit? Jesus answered, Throwing this kind of spirit out requires prayer. In other words, it's a different kind of spirit. It may be a stronger spirit than what you've encountered before. Uh, for whatever reason, you, you were not effective in this situation. So Jesus moves then in, in verse 30 uh, to, again, predicting his death. 
From there, Jesus and his followers went through, through Galilee, but he didn't want anyone to know it. He, this was because he was teaching his disciples. Um, he was having private time with his disciple, and, he, and you know, every time people found out he was in an area, they overwhelmed him. And so he was really wanting to spend time with the disciple. He is beginning to understand and know that his time is drawing nigh, and, and whatever he shares with the disciples has to be very intentional. And so he, uh, he, the human one will be delivered uh, into human hands. They will kill him. Three days after he has, is killed, he will rise up. But they didn't understand this kind of talk, and they were afraid to ask him. Ever been in a classroom where you were totally lost, but you didn't want to ask the teacher? <laughs> you didn't want to ask the professor because it makes you look like you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> you know we try to do what we can to bluff through those kinds of things. And so in this instance, uh, that's what we have here. They, they, they know they don't know, but they don't want to re be rebuked by Jesus, so they're afraid to ask. At that point, they enter Capernaum. Uh, when, and when they had come into a house, he asked them, what were you arguing about during the journey? They didn't respond since they, on the way, they had been debating which one of them would be the greatest. He sat down, called the 12, and said to them, whoever wants to be the first must be least of all and servant of all. Jesus reached for a little child, placed him in the, among the 12, and embraced him. Then he said, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. I am the presence, but I am God's presence here. Uh, it goes beyond me. The other thing that's interesting here is he goes into the house and it says he sat down. And if you remember, that is a symbol. This is a teaching moment. Um, when, when the professor sat down is when class began. Uh, in our tradition, the teacher stands up and everybody else sits. In that tradition, everybody else stood and the teacher sat down. And when they sat down, it was a sign, now class is in session. So John, and then we move on to um, recognizing our allies. Uh, John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone throwing demons out in your name. And we tried to stop him because he wasn't one of us. John appears to be uh, frustrated. There are others beginning to act in Jesus' name. You know, we're a part of the A-team. Uh, you know, these people out here don't have the authority to act on your behalf. Um, so John appears to be frustrated. And, and, he, and you'll notice that he says us. Uh, we tried to stop him because he's not, he wasn't, he's not one of us. You know, us and you, Jesus, <laughs> we're all here together. Uh, with that. And so they say, uh, I assure you that whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will certainly be rewarded. Disciples try to, to keep the man out, but Jesus opens the circle larger. Uh, Jesus is beginning to move forward in his ministry. The movement has begun. And so it's not just contained by this group of, of, of young uh, men. Uh, it is beginning to move farther out there. And Jesus draws a wider circle than maybe the disciples are comfortable with at this point. And, and Jesus begins to ask them to put aside their petty jealousy. You know, it, it's hard it, sometimes for others to get recognition. It's hard for others to do things that we think are special, uh, that we have a special relationship with, with our leader. Uh, we're the ones that, we're number two on the, the organizational chart, uh, whatever it might be. We're leading from a second chair role, and others are out there beginning to take that role too. As for whoever causes these little ones, and, and little ones here is not just the children, it's new converts to the faith who believe in me to trip and fall into sin. It would be better for them to have a huge stone hung around their necks and to be thrown into the lake. If your hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter uh, into life crippled than to go uh, away with two hands into a fire of hell which can't be put out. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. 
It's better for you to enter life lame than to throw it into hell, be thrown into hell with two feet. If your eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out. Sometimes we say, you know, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg to do something. Um, in life, and, and that's kind of what Jesus is implying here. Uh, that's, what, that's what people are saying. It, it's costing an arm and a leg. It's better for you to enter God's kingdom and, and one eye, with one eye to be thrown into hell with two. That's a place where worms don't die and the fire never goes out. Uh, that's the point of judgment. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? Maintain salt among yourselves and keep peace with one another. Keep the flavor of the faith. Keep the essence of the faith. It's through salt that we are able to preserve food. It's through salt that we add flavor to it. And God calls us to be uh, salty as best we can. So begin conversation around your table. Questions that are there as well as on the screen.